to the news report about a robbery and then complete the notes from the detective's notebook. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. There has been an armed robbery this morning at the Halifax Building Society's branch in Edward Street. John Brings is at the scene with Detective Sergeant Henry Lawson. Detective Sergeant, can you tell us what you know about the robbery? Yes, the raid took place this morning, shortly after 11.30, when a man accompanied by a woman went into the offices of the uh, building society and asked to see the manager. Uh, there were no other customers in the building at the time. They were let into the manager's office and the woman produced a gun from her handbag. Then they took the manager back out of his office and made him tell the cashiers to hand over all the money they had in the tills and in the safe. Uh, it came to about $25,000. Presumably you have a number of witnesses. Yes, uh, we have a good description of both of them. Uh, the man was about 1 meter 80 centimeters, around 35 years of age, with blue eyes and short curly red or ginger hair. He was wearing jeans, a green sweater and a three-quarter length blue coat. When he spoke to the cashier when he came in, he called himself Mr. Erickson, but we doubt whether that is his real name. But we do know that may be his real name. He also spoke with a strong Scottish accent, which may help us to trace him. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. And what about the woman? Now, she is in her early 20s, slim and quite tall, about 1 meter 70 centimeters. She was wearing a long white raincoat, which was quite loose-fitting, and which she didn't take off. She had a beige handbag which they used to hide the gun in. She's got straight, shoulder-length blonde hair, blue eyes, and, like the man, has a noticeable accent. Do you have any other information? Yes, the car they used was seen by two or three people. It's a blue or dark blue Ford Escort, and we have the registration number. And it's G595ERI. I'll say that again. It's G595ERI. Now, the car was stolen from Bishopstone just over a week ago, so if anyone has seen it in the last week, we would like to hear from them. We also know that the car's front left headlight was broken when it was stolen, and is still broken, we think. So, you would like information from the public about the car? Yes, and the people. We're appealing to anyone who thinks they may recognize the two robbers or know anything about the car. We've set up an incident room in Swindon and the telephone number is 774529. So we would like people to ring us if they have any information. Uh, and of course, all calls will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the number again, if you have any information, is 774529. 
And now back to the studio. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part two. You are going to hear an interviewer who is interviewing Alan. He made a great discovery of Mungo National Park. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the interview, answer questions eleven to fifteen. An event occurred in 1996 over a period of three days that attracted considerable attention at the time, and led to a new find in Mungo National Park, which is the focal point of the Willandra Lakes World Heritage Area in New South Wales, Australia. I talked to Alan Moore, the organizer of this trip, about his experience. Alan. What was the purpose of your trip? Well, as you know, I love the outback and lead tours of people wanting to go into more remote parts of the country. However, I thought it was time for me too to have a holiday, so I packed up my family and we went to Mungo National Park. Why did you choose this location? It holds a record of Aboriginal life stretching back over forty thousand years, and of course, I wanted my young kids to be amazed by the main feature of the park. The remarkable walls of China, as they're called, where wind and water erosion have exposed this long history. I see. What was the weather like? It was unusual for that time of year. The rain was just one continual downpour after another. We were always soaked to the skin, so we decided to cut our holiday short and only stayed three days in the end. However, it was eventful. The obvious problem was to get back to the nearest town, a small place called Boronga. But the dirt roads out there are always impassable after rain, so we settled down for a long, wet wait in the park. We didn't really mind because the scenery was so interesting. However, the kids wandered away without our noticing, and eventually we realized they must be lost. So we used our two-way radio to contact the park rangers and the police, and a helicopter was sent. Luckily, the kids were found within a few hours, but they'd made an important discovery. Now look at questions sixteen to twenty. As the talk continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. So the trip was also eventful for another reason, wasn't it? Yes, yes. They led us to some ancient Aboriginal art. The kids had taken shelter in a very small, low cave that was difficult to see from the outside. We were lucky to have another family camping in our location. When they heard us calling the kids, they immediately helped us search for them. And as the hours went by, they also provided us with much-needed support and encouragement. We really appreciated their help. And as we were already soaked through after looking for the kids for a couple of hours, they even made sure we had enough dry clothes to wear. The park ranger managed to get through to us to lead the search, and when the helicopter pilot notified us by two-way radio that he'd seen the children but was unable to land nearby, we were able to eventually find them very excited about what was in their little cave. And what did you think of their cave? Well, after squeezing in, I must say I was impressed. And managed to take a few photos of it before we left. There were many faint markings and dots on the wall. It was difficult to tell what they represented because they were so small. But people from the museum who have since visited there said the markings were similar to some other findings in the area, 
and later confirmed they were very old. Although it's now a protected site, the children like to call it their cave and are allowed to visit it when a ranger can go with them. Thank you, Alan. If you go to Mungo National Park, you can see the entrance to the cave and some of Alan's photos at the ranger's station. Alan continues to lead tour groups in the outback, and if you want further information, That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two geography students, Jack and Katie, talking about a field trip to Kenya in Africa. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Katie, hi. Thanks for inviting me round. Oh, thanks for coming. I know you're up to your neck in finals revision, but I've got to make up my mind about next year's geography field trip, and I'd really like your advice. We've got to choose between an African trip and one in Europe. They've told us a bit about both trips in the lecture, but I really can't make up my mind, and I know you did the African one last year. That's right. So, where exactly did you go? I mean, I know it was in Kenya, in East Africa. Yes. Well, we were right up in the northwest of the country. It was beautiful. We stayed in a place called the Marich Pass Field Studies Centre. Right. Dr. Rowe said the accommodation was traditional African-style cottages. Uh, he had a special name for them. Bandas. Yes, they're fine. You have to share two or three people together. They're pretty basic, but you have a mosquito net. They don't provide spray, though, so remember to take plenty with you. You'll need it. <laughs> and there's no electricity in the field centre. You'll have hurricane lamps instead. They give a good light. It's no problem. What about places to study? Dr. Rowe said there was a library? Yes, but it's quite small. There's a lecture room as well, but most of us worked out in the open air. There are plenty of places outside, and it's so beautiful. You're right in the middle of the forest clearing. I gather it's a relatively unmodernized area. Definitely. They actually set up the centre there because it's on the boundaries of two distinct ecological zones. The mountains, where the people are mainly agriculturalists, and the semi-arid plains lower down, where they're semi-nomadic pastoralists. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. So how much chance did you get to meet the local people there? Did you get the chance to do interviews? Yes, though we had to use local interpreters, but that was okay. Then we did field observation, of course, looking at environmental and cultural conditions and morphological mapping. What's that? Oh, looking at the surface forms of the landscape, the slope elements and so on. What about specific projects? Yes. 
After the first two or three days, we spent most of our time on those. We could pretty well do what we wanted, although they all had to relate to issues concerned with development in some way. People did various things. Some were based on social and cultural topics, like the effect of education on the aspirations of young people. And some did more physical process-based studies, looking at things like soil erosion. My group actually looked at issues relating to water, things like sources such as rivers and wells, and quality and so on. It was a good project to work on, but a bit frustrating. We felt we needed a lot more time, really. Right. Dr. Rowe did say something about limiting project scope. Yes, he told us that too at the beginning, and I can see why now. What else? Well, we had some good trips out as part of the course. We went to a market town, a place called Sigur. That was to study distribution. And to look at agricultural production, we went to the Weiwei Valley. That's an important agricultural region. And what about animals? Did you have a chance to go to a national park? Sure. We did a trip on the last day, on the way back to the airport at Nairobi. But actually, there was lots of wildlife at the field centre. Vervet monkeys and baboons and lizards. Mm, it does sound good. It was excellent, I'd say. In terms of logistics, it was very well run. But it was more than that. I mean, it's not the sort of place I'd ever have got to on my own. And it was a real eye-opener. It got me really interested in development issues and the way other people live. I did find it frustrating at the time that we couldn't get as far as we wanted on the project. But actually, I'm going to follow it up in my dissertation. So it's given me some ideas and data for that as well. So you'd say it was worth the extra money? Definitely. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture about product life cycles. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'm going to begin my lecture today with a look at product life cycles. Now, as we go through the product life cycle, I will be trying to raise some issues which are important with regard to each phase of the cycle. I won't have all the answers for you this morning. This one of the lecture series is just to get you started and, uh, I hope, interested. Let's start with the first phase of the cycle, that of product design. This is really the most important part of the cycle. We often talk as if it is consumers who are responsible for recycling, and so they are, but in reality, the major responsibility must be borne by designers. They can design products where recycling is easy and cheap, or difficult and expensive. In the latter case, the likelihood is that recycling, though technically feasible, will not in fact take place. Now, don't jump ahead, because the second stage is not product manufacturing, but rather that of materials acquisition. 
This is the activity we do when we mine coal or other minerals such as gold or iron or copper. In addition to mining, there is harvesting, which includes the cutting down of trees as a first step in the making of furniture or paper, or fishing. These activities have costs which are not only money costs. Pollution is one of the extra costs. We have also to think whether the resources we use are renewable, such as trees, or not, such as coal and other minerals. The third stage is not manufacturing either. It is materials processing. This is where we take the raw materials and use energy to change them into a form that can be used in manufacturing. Uh, for example, trees must be turned into paper or oil into plastic. The cotton plants that grow in the fields must be turned into cloth. All of these activities require the use of chemical processes and, as with all chemical processes, waste is produced, often of a dangerous kind. And now we come to the manufacturing stage. This is usually the most expensive in terms of cost and energy and waste. The wastes are often those that contribute to global climate change. For example, we make 41 billion glass containers, mostly bottles, each year, and we throw most of them away. A lot of manufacturing seems unnecessary if we could only organise things better. And this could mean greater profits for the manufacturing companies too. Stage 5 is packaging. Many products are packed in paper or plastic, which themselves, of course, have their own processes and costs. Excessive packaging is often criticised, but it must be remembered that packaging serves a purpose, often more than one purpose, such as maintaining freshness and hygiene, as well as providing information. In our globalised world, we must never forget the next stage, which is distribution. This is the stage where transportation and energy play a big part. Lorries, trucks, trains, planes and ships all use up the precious stocks of oil and, as we know, generate greenhouse gases which, as we hear again and again, contribute to climate change. Stage 7 is the point of it all. Using the product. Looking after products, using them in the recommended ways, timely repair and maintenance all reduce the need for early replacement and reduce the number of products in landfill sites. We should not encourage the purchase of single-use products, that is, products which are designed for use on one occasion only and then to be thrown away and replaced. Um, I'm going to skip a stage for a moment and move straight on to the final stage, which is disposal, putting the product in the bin. This is the end of the life of the product and we lose it completely. It may have only a little value, but it does have a value even at this stage of its life, even in fact when it's actually in the landfill site. Now, I missed out one stage. This is a cycle within a cycle. That is, within the life cycle of the product, there can be a closed loop cycle which can extract more value from the product. This is the reuse and recycle loop. It is a closed loop because, in theory, it can continue forever, though in practice, of course, this is not possible. Recycling products mean that they can be used to make more of the same product. Uh, CDs, bottles, books, or that they can be used to make different ones. For example, one pound of recycled paper can make six cereal boxes. And if we recycled all our newspapers, we could save 40,000 trees a day. Now, with this approach to the life cycle of a product in mind, we can go on to consider life cycle analysis. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Mm -hmm.